today for us to be defined by our failures and our weaknesses. The Lord, he wants us to dwell on them, meditate on them, focus on them. The enemy wants to destroy our future and our hope. He wants to get us so mired in the past and in our weaknesses that we must, we must defeat these three things. What is our response to be? Well, like Nehemiah, we're going to pray to God. We're going to cry out to God. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn the reproach on their own heads. Lord, give them as plunder into the land of captivity. Lord, you're going to give what they're saying. They say that we're going to be the, the one that's their plunder. But, Lord, the other is going to be true. They're going to become our source of strength. Lord, we're going to pray that others will say will be turned back on them. Lord, what others the enemy has meant for evil, you will turn to good. Lord God, what others have said about us and about our people and about our, our work, Lord, is going to be turned back on them. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, as Nehemiah did, that they would go into captivity. The enemy is going to go into captivity. We know the enemy of our soul that's fighting us is going to be held captive for a thousand years before he's cast into the lake of fire permanently. God, we pray that they would go into captivity and all those who are associated with him, God, I pray, will be carried away. Lord God, let it, we will remind you, Lord. We remind you, God, that the enemy is provoking us. He's provoking you to anger. God, Lord God, we're just trying to do your work. And finally, God, we're going to, we're, instead of, Lord, listening to their words, we're going to act. We're going to build the wall. We're going to install gates. We're going to fill in the gaps. Lord God, we know that we're halfway there. We know that we're halfway there. Lord, we're well on our way, Lord Jesus, to restoring what's been taken away. We pray and cry out to you. We want to allow mockery to discourage us. We want to allow others to disparage our hope. To do, Lord, to make light of it, Lord, we will act. We will have a mind to work. Oh, give us a mind to work, Lord, in the prayer closet. Give us a mind to work in sharing our testimony. Give us a mind to work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't have time to go through all the next three, so I'm just going to mention them quickly, and then we'll pray for them. And with the direct attack of the enemy, he's going to bring a conspiracy. There's going to be unity among the enemy. The enemy desires, he desires to not only bring a conspiracy, but confusion. He wants to bring disunity among God's people. We want to allow this. Lord, we respond by keeping our focus. We will be alert. We will be on guard. We will pray for protection. Day and night, we will call upon the blood of Jesus. We will call upon you, Lord. The enemy desires desires to bring weakness and reproach. Lord, he desires to weaken us from within, to weary us. Lord, the enemy desires to distract us, to se cause separation among us. He wants us to come down from our work. Lord Jesus, let's, he wants us to compromise. Lord, he wants to assassinate our character. Lord Jesus, he wants us to attack our reputation. Lord Jesus, while we do, what will we do? We will focus on our purpose. We will pray for strength. And finally, the enemy wants to bring reproach upon us. Lord Jesus, he wants to bring reproach. He wants us to do things that we should not do. He wants us to, to encourage us and even use people that say that they're people of God. Even use people that we would consider to be valuable prophets and priestesses among us. He will try to use someone inside the church to convince us to turn to do those things which are sinful or presumptive, Lord. Things that we, Lord Jesus, would just assume are okay rather than communing with you. Lord Jesus, we don't want to fall, Lord, to the trap of AI. Lord Jesus, where we just assume that because we're doing God's work, we don't need to consult with you. We need you every moment of the day. Lord, I pray, release among us a spirit of conscience, a spirit of courage and boldness. Let us be courageous. Let us be committed. We are in covenant with you. Lord, develop our character. I will not act in any way that's sinful. I will not give in to, Lord, the will of the enemy. I will not give cause for an evil report of me. God, I will not bring reproach upon myself, upon my family, upon this church, and above all, I will not bring reproach upon you, God. Could we just praise him in conclusion? I thank you, Lord, that you've heard our prayer tonight. I thank you, Lord. I praise you for giving me the power to overcome. I thank you, Lord, for the, the word of God that you have given us to clearly direct us, Lord, in the future. Lord, your word, Lord, to fight against all the power of the enemy. We pray these things in your name. Hallelujah. We are the people of prayer. We are the people of praise. God, we've committed our way to you. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. I'll give you a minute or two, and then we'll start service. God bless you. Amen.
rest of you. Okay. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. Up at Bandit Camp there this weekend. Had a great time. And uh, but it's so good to be back here. It's so good to feel the presence of the Lord. God is everywhere. And he's great. God is great and greatly to be praised. So let's do that tonight. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. We're thankful to God for your presence. We're thankful, Lord God, that we can call on your name. Jesus. We're thankful that we know who you are, Lord Jesus. We just pray to God.
Father Poirier, dear God, you see his burden, you see the struggle he faces, dear God. We pray, dear God, that you would send him help, that you would send him strength, dear God, that you would minister to him, dear God, that you, Lord God, uplift his spirits, Lord God. Lord, and send, Lord Jesus, help his way, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray, Lord God, for these other requests, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for John, Lord Jesus, you would touch him, Lord Jesus. Lord, you see the need, Lord God, tonight, Lord, we pray, dear God, Lord Jesus, for the Lord, request with cancer, Lord God, we come against this disease, dear God, every sickness, dear God, every infirmity, dear God, that is represented here tonight, Lord Jesus, we come against it, Lord God, we lose healing, God, we lose strength, Lord God, we lose joy, Lord God, in our lives, Lord Jesus, Lord, we pray, dear God, for their souls, dear God, those that do not know you, dear God, that they would come, Lord, to the knowledge of you, dear God, that they would come to repentance, dear God, that your will would be accomplished, Lord, and you would show yourself strong, Lord, in Jesus' name. have this promise. We do. Amen. Let's go to another level of power tonight. Another level of authority. Amen tonight. Amen. Turn around to your neighbor. High five them. Bump fists. Say hello. Do something. But love on them. Amen. Let them know you're glad they're here. Amen. Glad to be in the house of the Lord. Just stay standing so we won't have to uh, we won't have to get you down and up. We're going to go to Job 39, verse 27. Continuing our series, mount up. Mount up. Go to another level. God wants to mount up. Amen. Job 39, verse 27. First book of the Bible written, most scholars believe. And right in this book, it says this. Does the eagle mount up at your command? This is God talking to Job, asking a question. 
and make its nest on high? What a great question. Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? He's implicating there. He's, he's kind of saying, hey, I'm the one that makes the eagle be able to fly. I'm the one who allows it to have its nest on high. Not you, Job. And aren't you glad that God has called us to fly like the eagle if we will wait on the Lord, if we will learn of him? And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wants us to, to climb up. You must go to another level, climb higher, to get on a horse, ride it if we need to, climb a mountain, go to a higher place, whatever we need to do to go to the next level. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, in this time of studying the Word together, we want to go to another level of understanding, another level of revelation. I pray for the minds and hearts of all of us here tonight. Open our understanding. God, help us to go to another level. In your presence, we pray. We want to climb higher. We want to fly. Jesus, in your name. God bless you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to where we're going to be tonight. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. That's where we'll be spending the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Lord willing. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Amen. I should have really had someone do some reading for me. It would have helped me out a little bit. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing or raiment in the King James Version? Uh, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you... By worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Here's a good question. And he goes on to ask another question. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Neither do they toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed or clothed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? I'm going to read, save the rest of the next several verses for later. Um, let me just jump in here. You know, God has a plan for us to go higher. One of the things that holds us down, guess what, is worry. <laughs> Can I get any honesty here? Have you ever worried in your life? Just me? Don't leave the pastor all up here by yourself. Good Lord, people. Amen. This is going to be a long message if you don't stay with me here. Amen. We, need to be cons we, we don't need to worry. God doesn't want us worrying. The first part of this passage here, verses 25, 26, and 27, God uh, in flesh said to us, don't worry. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Jesus begins by saying, don't worry. It's a commandment. It's something he's stating. In his kindness, he commands us not to worry. You say, how is that kind? I'll tell you why. Because a lot of us need someone to tell us the right thing to do. And if it's our God, how kind is it that our master, our savior, gives us permission? In fact, more than that, not only permission, but requires us to not worry. He removes, now this is really interesting, I think. When he states this, he's saying, I'm taking some of the responsibility and rights that you have away. Wow. What is he saying? He says, if I'm your master, then you don't need to worry about food and clothes because that's my responsibility. As we'll discover later, my, I only have one duty. We'll talk about that later. I only have one responsibility when I have a master. When you have a master, we don't see that in our culture, so we don't understand it. But it's really important that if we are going to get into this level of going to another level of God, actually what we have to do is actually release some things. If you want to go to another level, you've got to let go of some things. You've got to let go of some worry. Worrying about where you're going to, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to put on or about your body is actually God is very clear here to us that we are not to worry about those things. Uh, food, drink, your body, what you wear, they're not things we should be concerned with. And Jesus goes on to give analogies. Now, he, he gives a couple analogies in this passage. 
and the first one here is the birds of the air. He says, if the birds of the air don't sow and don't reap and don't gather into barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them, He's kind of making a point here, don't you think? In other words, even if you only have a bird brain, you could figure this out. Is Jesus having a little fun here, maybe? I think he might be. He's saying, you know what? You don't have to worry because Jesus, God takes care of the birds. They don't even sow or reap. They don't even work. They don't even work. They just chirp around and flutter around. We watched them all summer. Amen. They just, they're just going everywhere, flitting here and there, flying through the air. And, you know, God takes care of them. You know, he feeds them. And Jesus asks three questions during this, this, these three verses of Scripture, 25, 26, and 27. He asks three questions in just a short space to make his point. Number one, the first question Jesus asks is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Hey, you want to take something to your prayer closet? It's a good question to answer. If you haven't resolved this question, you're going to have worry. If you haven't already decided that guess what? Life is more than food, and your body is more than about clothing, then you're going to worry. Okay? So life, hopefully, for you is about more than just, what's my next meal? <laughs> I hope that your, you know, your body is about more than just, oh, what am I going to wear? I mean, that sounds almost, I, can I say it this way? It sounds very first world of us, Right? You know, what am I going to eat? Well, let me think. Well, I get so many choices. Have you ever tried to go out with people in your family? I don't know. Maybe you don't have this problem. It's Everybody doesn't know what they want. Everybody has different ideas. Well, I don't know. What, I don't know. 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 What do you want for dinner? I don't know. I don't know. We have so many choices, so many options. We don't even, our worry is about stupid stuff like what are we going to eat? And it's not because we don't have food. It's because we have so many choices. We don't know what to do. And uh, so it's challenging. God's talking to us. Of course, the people that Jesus was talking to, a lot of them did have actual concern about if they'd have anything to eat. That's a different thing altogether, isn't it? And some of us probably, uh, if we think about our retirement, we think about later in life, we wonder if we're going to have enough food for clothes. And, and, and Excuse me, food to eat food to eat and we're going to have to clothes to wear and so Jesus asked that question and the second question Jesus asks here are you not of more value than they speaking of the birds now I know there's people in our world that actually would be more concerned with a bird dying than a human being that's kind of sad in our culture but Jesus is obviously making a value judgment here isn't he he's saying people are more valuable than animals there's no doubt about that He's saying, uh, you know, as valuable and as, as wonderful as a bird is, and God's concerned with even the sparrow that falls, as we read in the later scriptures on the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually, he's actually saying we have more value. We have a soul. We have an eternal destiny. And so Jesus is asking us a question. Don't you know that you're more valuable than birds? Then why are you worried about food and clothes? He's basically saying if you worry, you got a little problem here. You're not thinking straight. You're not realizing that you're more valuable. There's evidence all around you that God takes care of the birds. Why would you worry when you're more valuable than they? You have someone that worries about you, that's concerned about, not worries about you in the sense of, he's concerned about you, let's put it that way. He's more, he's concerned about you. And the third question that Jesus asked here is, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now, a cubit is basically <laughs> the space between the tip of your fingers and your elbow how many of you could think you could add that much height by worrying <laughs> you see, do you really think that worrying has ever made somebody taller <laughs> Jesus is saying he basically is giving you an impossible situation nobody can change their stature by worry so why is he asking such a ridiculous question well think about it for a minute what Jesus is saying is your questions might be just as ridiculous. That whenever you worry, you're being ridiculous. You're being silly because God is for you. You don't have to worry about these things. He gets even stronger later, but 
That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You can't add a cubit to your stature, so why do you worry? He's saying something quite, kind of absurd to make a point, isn't he? He's saying, man, you can't even change your height. What do you think worrying is going to do for you? Some of us might get smaller from worrying. I don't know. <laughs> that actually <laughs> could be very true. Amen. He didn't stop there in verses 28, 29, and 30. He talks about worrying about clothing. Why worry about clothing? And he actually starts off by asking another question. The fourth question so far. Well, so why do you worry about clothing? Going on a date? Why worry about clothing? Right? Why are you worried about what you're going to wear? And uh, when people get married, do they worry about their clothing? Oh, yeah, they do. You know, they want to have everything just right. Oh, well, it's one thing to do your best to dress well and look nice, but to worry about it, to put your, just have a sense of your value based on what you're wearing. Hmm. What Jesus is being very clear about here is yeah, our value is not dependent upon what we wear, whether we're wearing royal robes or linen robe. Our value comes from who we are in Christ and from the fact that he values us, not what we wear. What the world sees about us. In other words, if we have very little money and we have to do all hand-me-downs, some of you grew up with that. I had more than a few hand-me-downs from my cousins when I was growing up because we didn't have a whole lot of money. And uh, I've, and some of you have shared that with me that you have had to wear hand-me-downs. But, but you know, that's, that, that's not what your value is, though. It's not what we're wearing. You know, it's certainly not on the outside. And Jesus uses another analogy here. He talks about lilies or flowers of the field. He talks about flowers. He says, now, this, this is interesting. And so some of us, we have these kind of questions. You know, especially when I, I share the word of God with you and it's str fairly strong, you have, to not, you have to understand that God is not trying to con condemn us. What he's saying is, you know, there's room for growth. He sets the bar way up here so we know where we're aiming and so we realize we need God's help to get there. And so what God says here is, Guess what? The lilies of the field, they grow. Number one, they grow. That's pretty powerful stuff all by itself. I don't have time to dig into that, but he's basically saying, you know, you're going to grow. And as you grow, things are going to change. You're going to become blessed by God. Things will change in your life. And so as you grow, you don't even have to toil. It's just going to happen naturally. The, the, flower, the lilies of the field, they don't grow. They grow automatically. They don't toil. In other words, they don't work and sweat and, and, and work at it to get all this beautiful stuff and, and they have nice clothes and they don't spin, which from what I understand, that's pretty painful. Pro Has anybody in here ever sp spun thread? Probably not. We're not in a cotton environment. So let's, can you imagine having to make your own thread and then weave it into clothing? It was a very, it was a lot of work. My understanding is it's extremely, extremely um, challenging to, to turn um, wool uh, to warm cotton into into thread, uh, whatever kind of thing that you're using, and whether you're using different kinds of things, whether you're using wool or cotton, and so. But they had to spin it, and it was a lot of work to accomplish it, and all this work just to wear clothes. Um, and we know that that uh, you know Mary made a a garment for Jesus. Uh, uh, was uh, had no. Um, it was actually woven to be his shape, which is was a very expensive garment in the day it was a sign of his his of her love for him it had no no seams uh, it was a pretty amazing garment that jesus wore and um and so but that that his mother made it it took some serious work to do that and yet uh, god makes this analogy and he and he compares lilies of the field to probably the best dressed person that ever in the history of i don't know if what the world but certainly in the history of israel Solomon. He says Solomon didn't wear anything that even compared close, not even close to the glory of a flower, what they wear, the beauty of a flower. It's just amazing, so impressive. And then he goes on to say that God clothes the grass of the field. Now, it's interesting. Uh, this is just me with my little facts and things that I stick in my head through the years. But they say that grass is the most prevalent organism on the planet. And we're really thankful for it. 
I promise you. It holds things together. It grows in crazy places, in deserts. I mean, you, you, can almost, you almost can't go anywhere where there's not some type of gr a grass that will grow. And so, uh, God, but God even clothes the grass of the field. He makes them uh, valuable and precious. And the most common and necessary organism on the planet, God takes care of that. It's widespread. Can you imagine trying to count the blades of grass? We wouldn't even want to try and count a wheat field. One field. Never mind all the grass in the world. And God clothes them. And God, uh, and including not only the grass, but of course the flowers, everything that's in it. And yet, the Bible, he, Jesus makes the point, and the grass is just here for a short time. Flowers are just here for a brief period. I, I know our flowers outside, you know, the ones that were stellodors, I believe they're called, um, they were just here for maybe a couple weeks. And, and, and just they were just here. Some, some flowers are, are as quick as a day or two. They just... It doesn't take much at all. They're just here and they're gone. And yet God cares about those things and, and clothes them in such beauty. And he asks another question. Will he not much more? Listen to that strong emphasis by, by Jesus. Will he, our Heavenly Father, not much more clothe you? He asks a very direct question. And then he goes on to ask, point this out, and he connects worry to faith right here, doesn't he? Oh, you of little faith. Jesus connects worry to faith. In other words, you cannot worry and have faith at the same time. If you have little faith, then you'll worry about food and clothes. If you have strong faith, then you will trust God to take care of you. In fact, you can come to this conclusion based upon this, that if, if you worry about food and clothes, then it's a sign that you need greater faith. I don't think that's a stretch at all. I think Jesus is making that very clear. So what's Jesus' purpose? Rather than be condemned by what I'm sharing, uh, we should be maybe a little convicted at times, but we bring this to Jesus because, and, 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 and you can tell this throughout his ministry, and you can hear in the heart of Jesus as you read this passage and the passages that follow this, that Jesus was very concerned about the people of Israel, about people in the world, about people in, 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 in all of creation, all the people on the planet. He was concerned that they seemed so worried about food and clothes. And he, he addresses this clearly because he's moved with compassion for us. He doesn't want us wondering where our next meal has come from. He doesn't want us wondering if we're going to have clothes on our back. Jesus' purpose in talking about this is to get us to go to another level of faith, is to go to another level of belief, is to go to another level of, of, of power and understanding. He wants us to understand that love motivates God, that he's a good father. He's not an earthly father who sometimes fails us. He's not an earthly parent who sometimes let us down. He is a heavenly father who is always watching out for us. He wants us to be increased in our faith. He's trying to teach us that we're better than the birds, that we're better than the grass and the flowers of the field. We are more valuable. And yet God takes care of them, feeds them, and clothes them. Isn't that beautiful? Would you like to just take a minute to thank God for food and clothes? Then we don't have to worry about it. Thank you, Lord. These simple things of life. And sometimes we get so caught up. You're trying to teach us, Lord, not to worry about these things. You care for us. Thank you, Lord. We don't need to be of fear. We can be of faith tonight. Lord, you're, what motivates you is love for us. God, if you can take care of the birds and the flowers and the grass, how much more can you take care of me? Much more. Much more. How much more? Now, I want to talk to you about these last four verses. And uh, I'm moving right along here tonight. It'll take me a little bit of time to get through this next part. Because what he talks about here is he has some more questions. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? He makes a strong statement. He declares, do not worry. Having considered what I have said, Jesus is basically stating, in light of what I've said, in light of what we've already heard tonight, do not worry. Another passage in another scripture says, be anxious for nothing. But with prayer and supplication, make your needs known to God. Make your requests known to God. And, and so Jesus is making it very clear here. So I'm not just pulling this out of context. Obviously, he's made it 
point very quite a few times already in several verses here that we are not to worry. Don't worry. And, and he goes on to say this, therefore do not worry, saying, now that's interesting too, and I know I've shared this with you, and I know many of you have already caught this, but what God is reminding us tonight and through this passage is it's important what you say. It's important what you talk about. You know, as I'm getting older, I'm finding myself talking a little bit about my infirmities, about this pain and that problem and this challenge. We have to be careful what we claim. What we say is ours. We do. We need to be careful what we, what we say. We need to be careful that we don't go around worrying about food and clothes. We shouldn't be worried about anything. Is that true? So when we talk about problems, we need to be very careful because we're, it could be very possible that we're becoming anxious, we're becoming fearful, and we're becoming concerned. We use that concern very loosely. It's okay to be concerned in the right sense. But there's a wrong way to be concerned. If we're truly concerned, we should take it to our Father and leave it with Him. A child doesn't worry about their next meal. I've rarely seen children worry about their next meal. They just come bursting in the kitchen. I'm hungry. Nana, I want my food. Right? You know, what's for supper? Right? We, they don't worry about that. And they sure don't usually care about their clothes or they wouldn't get them so dirty. They, they don't have a problem. Right? I mean... God is trying to make a very clear point here that we need to become as little children. Does that sound familiar to anybody? As little children, we have faith that those things will be taken care of. We don't worry about Children don't worry about stuff. They really don't. You know, they can fall down and hurt their knee and be up and playing in 30 minutes. Isn't it amazing? I mean, they can have a big old spat with, a, with someone that's their friend, and then they could be playing again in just a few minutes. Why? Because they forgive quickly. They forget quickly. They move on quickly. And God's trying to teach us these things as our heavenly father and he goes on to says be careful what you say because let's be honest speech solidifies or makes worry real to us and you got to be careful what we talk about and i don't mean this wrong there have been times when i've had to shut down conversations with people it's one thing to say i have a prayer request it's another thing to describe every detail and to go into great detail on what's wrong do i really need to know that it's invaded every, asp every limp note in the body? Do I really need to know that? Do I need to know what it's doing to you? We were talking today. We were, we, uh, we were sitting at a meal, and my wife was remembering back to a person that had been around her, and they were sitting there eating with, with the staff members at the church in St. Louis. And, and, she was, and this gentleman, uh, right as they were eating, said, you know that water you're drinking is recycled, right? Who knows how many people and things it's been through before it got to your table to drink today. Now, and you know what brought that up? Because I was looking at, they gave me some, a little, a couple little, what do they call them? Chopsticks. They gave me some chopsticks, and for some reason, I was looking at them thinking, I wonder who put that in their mouth before me. And then my wife had the audacity to say, well, what do you think happened to your fork before you got it? And I was like, oh, well, yeah. I just didn't think of it. You know, we don't think of these things, really. And the truth is, it doesn't mean they're unclean. It doesn't mean they're dirty. But the reality is, sometimes when we talk about these things, they start grossing us out a little bit, like some of you are starting to feel a little queasy. Uh, wait a minute, yeah, I, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. I wonder how I, I wonder how everybody in the house used that spoon that I'm just using right now, right? I wonder what they did with that, right? <laughs> right? We, we, we don't really like to talk about these things. But, we, but let's be honest, single-use plastics are not a, a very good idea. So we, we're starting to get into some interesting stuff. Uh, the reality is that's part of life. Uh, every atom in your body has been somewhere else before. It's true. You know, I might have a little bit of Abraham Lincoln in me. Amen. I don't have any of Jesus. He's not here anymore. Right? But rea you know, the reality is we don't know. You know, we don't know what's in us. And it doesn't really matter because that's the point is that Jesus is making. We've got to be careful what we talk about because it, it impacts how we see things, doesn't it? There's really not anything wrong with eating from my 
fork that's been used before. That's the whole point, right? It's our culture that's made these things challenging for us. And so we have to be careful what we say because it makes something that really isn't a problem a problem. It's really not a problem. You see, in God's eyes, there's many things we worry about and we talk about in prayer, and God's like, I've already taken care of that. Why don't, why don't you just trust me with that? Why are you worried about these things? Why? I'm your father. Okay. Well, you don't believe me? Let's, let's look a little further. Jesus goes on to say, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. Anybody in this room that's not a Gentile? No, we're all Gentiles. However, we're also Jews by faith through Abraham, right? We have, as children of Abraham, by faith, because we believe in God, we become children of Abraham. And when we're children of Abraham, we also become Jews. The word Jew is just basically part from, comes from the word Judah, and it means basically people that are believers in the one true God, that praise God. Isn't that interesting tie into this morning? They're praisers of God. They believe and praise the one true God. That's their purpose. They praise the one true God. They worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so basically what Jesus is saying is if you worry about things, then you're being like a person that doesn't have a God. Your God is a God of failure. Your God is a God that is not able. Your God is a God of lack. Wow. Your God is yourself. Or what's going on with the, the country. Your, your God is something to do with the natural realm. That's what he's saying here. He's connecting this about basic concerns that if you get worried about these things that you're being like a Gentile. You're not acting like a child of God. You're not acting like a true worshiper because a true worshiper who praises God knows how great God is. They know how powerful God is. And so how could you worry when you know how God, great God is and how loving He is and how merciful He is and that He's not just somebody that's far off from us but He's our Heavenly Father. God goes, and he goes on to say, and he says this, and it continues in verse 32, the next sentence, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. It's a fact. Absolutely settled. See, this is the problem. If you're worrying, you haven't settled this question. You haven't settled the question about whether God knows that you need things. And that somehow God is oblivious to your needs. God just... God knows about everybody else's needs, but He doesn't know mine. <laughs> God gives everybody else all the good stuff, but I'm stuck with the nasty stuff. God, God's going to feed everybody else, but I'm just a worm. I'm a nobody. God doesn't see me. He's ignoring me. He's far from me. Oh, woe is me. Wow. If you're a loving parent and your kid starts acting like that, how would that make you feel? Two-year-old comes in. You're going to feed me today, dad, dad. No, you can't have any food. We don't do that. No, I'm not going to change your dirty diaper. You just, you made the mess, you live in it. What kind of God are you serving? God wants us to be great. He calls us to greatness, but He's a loving, merciful God. What kind of God are you serving? We're serving a loving God who wants us to be the best that we can, who calls us to great heights, but He's not asking you to get there by your own strength. He's saying, I will do it with you. I will go before you. I will make it possible. God knows that you need these things. He, God, Jesus is making it very clear. What He said multiple times through this passage is that He's our Heavenly Father. He's not like earthly fathers. He's not broken. He's not messed up. He doesn't fall short. He hasn't had his, he, he's got it together. He's got it figured out. And everything he needs, we need is we can find in him. That's a fact. That's a fact. Now, whether you accept it or not is your choice. You can choose worry if you wish. But how, how sad it would be to slap God in the face and say, you're not a loving father. You're not a heavenly, you're not good. You're a bad guy. No. He's a protector, loves to protect us, loves to be a strong tower and a refuge and a security and a shelter and a sanctuary for us. 
He wants to be a provider. He wants to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He wants to give, he's a prophet. He wants to speak into our lives words of direction and correction and provide uh, guidance for us. He wants to be a priest who cleanses us from all of our wrongdoing and, and makes us free from our failures and our shortcomings. God is our heavenly father, provides everything we can need of spirit, soul, or body. Oh, I wonder if we would take a minute right now to believe this. So Lord, I want this to be in my mind from this day forward. God, if there's been ever been any doubt, you know what I need. You know what I need. Lord God, you know what I need. You are a good God. You're a good father. You are a faithful friend. You are my protector. You are my provider. You are my prophet. You are my priest. You are the perfect example of all of these. The best thing I've ever seen in anybody, you are better than. So what should be our response to these facts, to what Jesus has said? To the fact we don't need to worry and that God knows what you need. Our response, according to Jesus, is, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Our response is to seek the kingdom, not these things. The proper response to knowing who God is and knowing that He loves us is to seek the kingdom, not things. To mount up, to go to another level, to go higher, to seek spiritual things rather than natural things. To stop messing around with dirt and junk and all the things of this world and go to a higher level and seek the things that are real value kingdom things and Jesus goes on to say and, and, and all these things will be added to we don't need to worry he goes on in verse 34 don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things don't borrow trouble don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have problems and issues but I'll be with you then too why don't you just focus on today and so sufficient for the day is its own trouble in other words you don't need to borrow from the past, and you don't need to borrow from the future. Just deal with today. How many of our problems will be solved? You know, you know, I've been around for a while. One of the things that we as psychologists and people that are preachers and pastors and people that have been around for a while, one of the things we've discovered is, and I've, I've talked to a lot of people, most people, if I talk to them and ask them, are you really worried you don't have enough food for today? Well, no. I've got enough food for today, but tomorrow, I don't know if God's going to take care of you know you know I, I'm I can get through today but how about tomorrow Jesus is extremely clear here I get through you help you through life one day at a time why are you going into tomorrow or the past the past is behind you it's covered by the blood I've taken care of it you're alive why are you worried about the past why are you worried about what you used to be or what used what happened before don't worry about that Today is enough to take care of. And we, Jesus taught us, he's even the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. He's not going to give you enough day. In the Old Testament, he only gave them enough manna for one day, except for the day before the Sabbath, so they could rest. See, God knows what we need and how much we need it. If you get it on certain days, it turns to worms. You get it on other days, it stays for 48 hours. Explain that. That's a miracle all by itself. The same stuff turns into worms after 24 hours. <laughs> and yet on that one day, it lasts for twice as long. That's crazy. You know, God knows what we need. He literally provided food for the Israelites for 40 years in the desert. So once they didn't figure that out, guess what they did? Well, I want some leeks and onions. What about meat? I want meat. Right? And so it's funny. Once we get comfortable with that God's going to supply, then we start raising the stakes. Well, this isn't enough. Now I want something nicer. I have a car, but it's a clunker. Now I want a Lamborghini. I want a Maserati. I want a Rolls Royce. You know, no, we don't really do that. But we do have a tendency to kind of go to the next step, right? Whatever the next level is. We want to mount up when it comes to a nicer car. <laughs> we, 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 want to, we want to get a, a nicer house. We want to get a nicer girlfriend, a boyfriend. We want to, hopefully not you guys that are married, but anyway, right? We, 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 we find these things, and so we have to be watchful. 
because we need to be only dealing with one day at a time. How many of our problems will be solved? How many of the things that you see someone worrying? You know, a simple question to ask is, is that a problem for today? Is that really a problem for today? Really? Today? That's today's problem? You're going to die and pass away if you don't have this? No. Most of the things we worry about, they're nothing to do with today. There's something about the future. Or they're a weir- uh, concern because of our past. But they're not really today's problem. And Jesus is very clear about this. We, God will give us enough strength and comfort for today. Now let me do some application here in the next uh, five or six minutes. Uh, a little bit of a challenge that Jesus lays out for us. It's interesting, and I think you probably figured this out because I made a point of it, that Jesus chose to use questions to make his point. Now we've gone through this series. Jesus asks a few questions, but here in three short paragraphs, in just a few verses of Scripture, what, 10 verses of Scripture or so? Is that correct? Um, Jesus asked a bunch of questions. I mean, a whole bunch of questions. So why is Jesus using questions? Now, this is a valuable thing to learn, both for yourself and for other people. By the way, this is something that my daughter probably will use sometime in being a clinician. Asking questions, if you go in to see a clinician because you've got worries or fears or doubts, they're going to ask you questions. And what they're doing is several things. Number one, Jesus is asking us questions to move us from an, an emotional response to a cognitive one. Now, that's fancy words for move you from feeling of, about it and what you feel, not live by what I feel. I think we even sang it tonight. But we need to live by what we know. We need to engage our brain. If you find yourself worrying or fearful or upset, start asking questions. That's what is really important. If you see someone else worried, start asking questions. Not just any questions, but the right questions. Because why? Because questions, by definition, require your brain to be engaged. And when you start getting your brain engaged, emotions get damp, tamped down. They, they get moved to the back burner. Jesus wants us to think, to use our minds and our reasoning. He wants us to know certain things. This is why we need to settle in our mind that my God shall supply all of our needs. We need to believe the Word of God. This is why we put the Word of God in our brain so that when God needs to ask us questions, we have answers that are biblically based rather than based on our history or based on our upbringing or based on what we've seen happen to other people. We need to be looking to what God actually says. The second thing I want to mention here about questions, Jesus uses questions to answer our questions. Did you ever have a teacher do that to you? Did you ever have a parent? I did that all the time when I was a youth pastor. Because young, you know, young people can be a pain. Did you know that young people and children can be a pain? They ask question after question, and some of them are silly, right? And some of them are just to provoke you sometimes. Now, I used to say, for many years, I said, there's no stupid question. There's no foolish question, but I've discovered differently over time. (laughs) What I have learned, though, is even if they're asking a silly or foolish question, a lot of times what they're revealing is what's really going on in the brain, right? And sometimes it's not a good thing. Jesus uses questions to answer our questions. If you're worrying about what are my foods come from, what am I going to eat, what am I, you know what God's going to do? He's going to start asking questions. He'll start saying things like, do you believe in me? Do you think I love you? He'll ask questions. God will start asking questions. Because in some sense, what Jesus is saying is, stop questioning. What he does is he makes it obvious that, that, that our questions are actually foolish sometimes our questions are foolish questions and you know one of the number one things I like to do uh, when I had young people around and we were on long trips how long is it when are we going to stop yeah. how, how much farther well I either ask a question or I use the same statement over and over again if you're ever with me on a long trip and you say how long is it going to be to the next stop I'll say the same thing every time Oh, about 15 minutes. And it's funny when you have 40 kids. Before long, they learn. Well, you can also ask questions. You can say things like, well, how long do you think it's going to be? 
And then they're like, oh, well, I don't know either. So, okay. <laughs> right? Well, how long do you want it to be? I can slow down if you wish. Right? Right? I mean, you, sometimes the best thing we can do, so Jesus used questions to help us realize that sometimes questions really aren't the answer. Ah, think about that for a minute. <laughs> In other words, worrying and asking questions doesn't really give you much help. I mean, it's kind of foolish sometimes to ask questions because it's, it's not helpful. It's not, it really isn't. And so I've used this also many times. I ask questions sometimes like Jesus does in this situation. And this is a valuable thing to do. You can ask questions of people to, to calm them down. Because again, they have to stop, you know, being so emotional and start thinking. So you want to calm people down you ask questions. Jesus wants us to calm down, so he asked us a bunch of questions. And we can't, we're trying to figure this out tonight. Look at all these questions. If God does this, if he loves the birds, if he, if he loves, you know, if he loves the you know, flowers of the field and he clothes them better than Solomon. I mean, he's asking questions. He's getting our brain engaged, right? It slows things down. When you ask questions, it's like a speed bump for your brain, for your emotions. So God asks questions of us. Do you ever read Job? What is our text tonight for this series? Is it not a question? <laughs> is it not a question about eagles? And you know, isn't that what it says? Does the eagle mount up at your command, Job? And make its nest on high? One of the things we discover in three or four chapters is that when God starts talking to Job, he's got a bunch of questions that Job can't answer. <laughs> and what's that point? It says, it teaches us we don't have the answers. And guess what? God does. So why are we, why are we questioning all these things? Why are we fearful? Why are we doubting? We just need to trust God. We need to trust God because we don't have the capacity to understand and have answers for everything. But God does. Why not trust him? Why not just put your faith in him? Why not just believe that he's a good God and that he's faithful? And this is the third thing I want to mention about questions. Jesus points out that questions by doing this and worry are actually a form of seeking. A desire for security, a need for control or comfort. When we ask questions, we're seeking, we're seeking something. We're longing for something. We're desiring security and we're, we're looking for a need. To, a need to be met. We were looking for control or comfort. And so Jesus has an answer for that, and that's what he already shared with us in verse 33. So as I conclude here tonight, I just want to mention verse 33 again. But seek first. Jesus' answer to worry is singular. He says a very clear statement here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Instead of focusing on many things, Jesus says, focus on one. You see, we confuse ourselves and we create worry, especially in a culture like ours where we have so many choices and decisions. And that actually, for a lot of people, creates a lot of anxiety. We have too many options. We have too many things that we can do. And that makes it difficult for us. When you're poor, you don't have a whole lot of options. And so you have simple faith. When you're a child, you don't have a whole lot of options. You can't drive to the store, so you just, whatever's in the table, whatever they feed you, that's what you eat. So you don't wor learn to worry. It's when we have choices and we start thinking that we've got lots of options that we start having trouble. So one of the things that we have to learn, especially as North Americans, is to stop focusing on, trying to focus on so many, multitasking is not going to help. Distracting yourself is not going to help. Reducing, you know, why do people get drunk and go on alcohol and drugs and things like that? Because it simplifies. It focuses your mind on one thing, pleasure, or one thing, and you'll just start, you know, it, it reduces you. It simplifies your life. And so people get addicted to these things because they get addicted to the idea of simplicity. But you can simplify your life by focusing on one thing, and Jesus tells us what to focus on. Number one, he says, seek. In other words, you've got to search for it. It's not going to happen to you by accident. If you want to put your energy into something, why not put it into seeking something rather than worrying about something? Worry is a form of seeking. So why not seek for the right thing is what Jesus is saying. If you're going to, if you're going to think about something, if you're going to attempt something, then seek 
Some seek this thing. And then he says not only seek it, but the second thing he tells us is to seek it first. Not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth. Seek God and the kingdom first. Seek first. Long first for God. If I was to ask you, do you seek first the kingdom of God? That's a good question. That's a good question. Because that's a question that leads to life. And if you, if you can answer it affirmatively, I do seek God first. I do seek the kingdom first. I am trying to put God first in my life then you're on the right road. Number one, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm seeking for God. I want to be clothed with His righteousness, right? I want to be identified with Jesus, so I'm longing, I'm seeking for Him, and I'm going to put it first. And the, second, the third thing here is, what are we seeking first? The kingdom. And the, I, I, I'm not going to go into depth here, but let's be honest. We're all looking for a king. We're all looking for something to rule over us. We, by nature, are followers, even leaders are followers. We are. We're serving something or some idea or some dream or some ambition. We are. We have a kingdom that we're trying to create or that we're trying to be part of. I'm just telling you. You got some idea of what you want to be. We all want something to rule over us. And it's amazing. I mean, there's a whole mess of stuff, and I don't have time to go into it, in our culture about this master-slave thing. And you'll see it in their nose rings and different things like that that they're, they're doing now. It's this whole concept in our culture. It's a human desire to feel safe and secure. A lot of people, by the way, are giving up their freedoms and their rights in a wrong way so that they have a sense of security so they don't have to worry. Let someone else decide for me. Let the boss decide for me, Right? How many people could have been much farther down the road, started their own company if they'd wanted to, but they didn't want to have to have those, deal with those issues. So they found something that was safe. The only thing that's truly safe, though, in this world is to make Jesus your king. I can tell you that from a truth. When you, are, when you have the king of kings in charge and the lord of lords in charge, you don't have to worry about other lords and other kings because you are serving the greatest master that's ever existed. So, Seek. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom. Come under the submission and authority of, of who? Whose kingdom is it? God's. Wow. We just kind of talked about that briefly, about king of kings and lord of lords. But we're not just talking about just any king of kings and lord of lords. There's been many people that were emperors, that were rulers over many other kings and many other lands. But this one is not just only a lord and a king and a lord of lords and king of kings. He's also God. The kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom. And I'm part of that kingdom. I'm, his, I'm under His leadership. I'm his, under His authority. I'm under His dominion. He is the one in control. If you're worried about something, you've forgotten who's in control. Or you're not seeking the kingdom, maybe. I don't know. But I believe that we're all seeking the kingdom. So why not let Him be in control of you? Why don't you serve the Lord and serve Him with gladness? Woo! Hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. Let Him be your master. Let Him be your heavenly Father. Why don't you let Him be God? All-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. It goes on to say, and His righteousness. When you seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that righteousness is talking about lifestyle. It's talking about doing things God's way. When you seek to do God's way, it doesn't mean you've already arrived. We're still growing. We're still becoming. We're, still, we're not there yet, but we're going in His way. We're following in His way, His lifestyle, His plan, His purpose, His purity. That's what it means to be righteous. We're following His plan, right way. We're following His purpose, the right purpose, the right the right. Uh, motivation, the right purity. In other words, clean and free from so many other things and, and from other desires and ambitions and His righteousness. So the kingdom of God, His kingdom, not our kingdom. One of the things that I saw, and I, uh, Lord, if you'd come, when I came here, and I still sense it to a great extent, is that a lot of people in, in this province and in Canada have built their own kingdoms. And I'm talking about in churches. I, I hate to say it, but even people of God can sometimes stop building the kingdom of God and start building their own kingdom. Well, I just want my own rule. I just want God to do things my way. I want to be a king under the king. I want to be an authority under the authority. 
And there's some truth to that, folks, but not the way that I'm seeing it. We're not trying to build a kingdom of man. I want to build the kingdom of God. Yes. Yeah, of course. Sure. Okay. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So there you go. You get it all wrapped up in one verse of Scripture, don't you? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. No question. No question. So the beautiful thing about this is what Jesus said here at the very end, is this comes with a promise, doesn't it? If you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things should be added to you. All these things. Wow. I love that. What a promise. Could we just lift our hands toward heaven and thank Him for this? Could we praise Him for being such a faithful friend and Father? Lord, all these things. Woo! I don't need to worry about anything. <laughs> if I don't worry about stuff, I'm going to go to the next level of faith. I'm going to go to the next level of belief. Lord, I might, that maybe right now I'm worrying about my, my problems, my sicknesses, my finances, but Lord, if I can stop that for just a little while, Lord, if I will seek you and put you first and put your kingdom first and seek your righteousness, <laughs> all these things that we get so caught up in will be added unto us. I can go to the next level of worry-free living Worry-free living. I don't need to worry about anything. Instead, I can pray about everything. And I can ask God for what I need. <laughs> and my God shall supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. That's time to mount up, folks. It's time to fly. It's time to ride. It's time to go another level of God. We shouldn't worry about anything. It's His command and it's call. It's a call to come up. A call to come to a higher level. Let's not worry. Let's trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Let's not lean on our own understanding. Let's acknowledge Him in all of our ways. I promise you, He will direct our daily, daily, daily path. Amen. Let's worship the Lord right now. Let's take our time. Hallelujah, to live a life of faith, to live a life of hope, to live a life of joy and gladness every day. Woo. Oh, I feel the anointing in the house tonight. He cares. You care for me, Lord. <laughs> oh, that's, why don't you lift your hands and surrender? Why don't you confess with your mouth? Be honest with him. Lord, I'm worried. I've been speaking some things I shouldn't speak. Help me to speak faith. Help me to speak power. Let me speak, let me speak praise, Lord. Worship to you. Just to all. Help me to grow in this, Lord. Help me to grow in this, Lord. Help me to grow in it. Grow in faith. Lay aside every weight. Lay aside everything that hinders. Come on, cast off your worries about your spouse, about your family, about their future. Trust in the Lord. We take it to prayer and we leave it there. We take it to prayer and we leave it there. Fill me with joy and peace. Just to walk means everything. Oh, come on, cast your cares on Him. He cares for you. He cares for me. Oh, come on, make it a fact. Just to walk. Lord, I won't worry about that. I'm going to live it with you. I'm going to confess it, Lord. I'm going to ask you for it, but I'm going to leave it with you. Just to know. 
I want to be your child, Lord. His hand, his <laughs> I don't worry about food or clothes or the future. Ooh, today is the day. the freedom. Come on, feel joy again. Come on, feel gladness again. Feel life like a flower better than a bird. Revival in the house tonight. Yes, a laying aside, a joy, a peace. Your life will never be the same. you're breathing, but I'm breathing the air of heaven tonight. Ooh, I feel a thrill in my soul. What a joy. <laughs> if that doesn't make you want to praise God, I don't know what will. I don't have to worry about anything. In fact, I'm commanded not to. I've taken too much responsibility. I'm considering my rights and I'm getting all bound up. My goodness. I'm not in charge. Jesus is charge. Jesus is my king. Jesus is my master. I don't have to figure it all out. Doesn't mean I don't need to use my brain, but I'm just saying I don't have to figure it all out. I can come to Jesus and he will answer by and by. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like a good song. Do you know that one? In the sweet by and by. Yes. I like thinking about heaven. If I'm going to think about my future, I'm not going to be focused on what's going on down here. Amen. In the sweet 
going to look back and say I should have worried more no the sweet use your strength for something worthwhile love the people around you hallelujah praise the Lord pray hallelujah that beautiful shore in the sweet in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore No, you can't get to heaven without S A L V A T I O N. Amen. These are the things that we should be looking at. Hallelujah. Would you like to stand with me as we go to dismissal? You're going to get up anyway. You might as well get up and pray. Prepare the way. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Lord, you would bless and keep everyone here. Lord, turn your face toward us. Give us peace. Make your face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us, Lord. Overshadow us, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus, we leave free. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.